God is King of Kings, and He's Lord of Lords. In Psalms twenty two twenty eight, it says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He is the governor among the nations. Genesis fourteen nineteen says, And He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Psalms 48, 2, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is king. He's possessor of heaven and earth. Throughout the Bible, God has allowed certain men or beings to be over his kingdoms. And this never changes the fact that he is king of kings and lord of lords himself. In Daniel 2, 20 through 21, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So even though the Lord is king of kings and lord of lords, he removes kings and he sets up kings. And consider those games where you build a city and act as God over that city. It's kind of like that. God created everything and everyone, and he lets his creation operate on their own free will. He removes kings and sets up kings. 1 Timothy six fourteen through 15 says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So the Lord is still king. He's always been supreme king. However, he allows men to rule over his kingdoms under him. And there is a wicked television show called Game of Thrones. This is because Hollywood can't get around the Bible. The Bible is about a king kingdoms and thrones it is god's game of thrones it's about someone going after a throne god the creator is up in heaven and he can see his creation just like he is looking down at a board game he can see his creatures fighting over the kingdom and this is why i titled the study god's game of thrones i've never seen the show so i don't have any idea what it's about so i googled it it's about two families playing a deadly game for control over seven kingdoms and to sit atop an icon throne. So, the Bible is about kings and kingdoms. It's about who is on the throne. Even, if, even in your life today, are you on the throne of your life? Or is God on the throne in your life? Is the flesh, the world, and the devil on your throne? Or is God on your throne? This world revolves around men trying to get on the throne of their field. Men are concerned with who is the greatest. And this is in any field, in anything in your life. Even the disciples were concerned with this. If you look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 1-4, through 4, it says, At the same time, came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then in Mark nine thirty four and 35, it says, But they held their peace, for by the way they disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. That's the disciples once again. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. So even the disciples themselves were concerned about who is greatest in the kingdom. In every form of entertainment, sport, art, factory, the government and churches and Baptist preaching, in the YouTube world and everywhere else, you have someone chasing a throne. Someone is wanting to be the greatest. LeBron James is chasing the greatness of Michael Jordan. And a good portion of what you see on ESPN talks about Jordan versus LeBron James. 
in boxing, someone is going after the heavyweight title. It's been like this the entire history of life. A man trying to get on the throne and the devil trying to get back a throne that he lost. And you will see this throughout the Bible. But before I go into detail on this, I want to quickly explain to you the difference in the two kingdoms. Because many teach that they are exactly the same, but the Bible shows us a difference in the two kingdoms. The first one we're going to look at is the kingdom of God. Now this is a spiritual kingdom. It is something that has always existed. It came into being before the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God cannot be taken over by man or by the devil. The kingdom of heaven can be taken over. The door of the kingdom of God cannot be shut. Like the Pharisees shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 23, 13. In Romans 14, 17, one of the greatest verses on the kingdom of God, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Notice it has spiritual things associated with it and not physical. Matthew 6, 31 through 33 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. This shows that the kingdom of God is direct opposite of the physical things mentioned in the verses we just read. Those things we desire, such as what we shall eat and drink and the clothes we put on. He says, before you worry about these things, seek ye first the kingdom of God, because they aren't these physical things. In Luke 17, 20 through 21, it says, When he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So you can't see the kingdom of God. It's not with observation. At least not yet because it's within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And there's only one way to enter the kingdom of God. As Jesus said in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to get saved. Entering the kingdom of God through believing the gospel and being born again is how you get the image of God. And remember that key phrase, image of God, because it's associated with the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Jesus Christ is the image of God. He is king of the kingdom of God. So when you were born again, you were no longer blinded by the God of this world. You were translated into the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.13 Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? Another great truth is that if the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing, then flesh and blood could not enter into the millennial kingdom, which is a physical, invisible, earthly kingdom. It says in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So if the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven were the same, then this verse wouldn't be true because Flesh and blood do enter the kingdom of heaven, but not the kingdom of God. During Jesus' earthly ministry, the kingdom of God was at hand. He was offering both kingdoms to the Jews. As he says in Mark 1.15, the kingdom of God is at hand. In John's gospel, the apostle John records how Jesus told Nicodemus how to enter the kingdom of God. Now you realize the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. You know the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. Many times men forget that there are three heavens. 
The first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is where the stars are. And the third heaven is where God is. The kingdom of heaven is not the third heaven. Like the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven was at hand when Jesus Christ was on this earth. Since the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven, it was postponed. It was put off for a time while the church age takes place. Right now, the kingdom of God is in operation through the church, but not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom, and the mentions of the kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, is confined to just one book. That book is the book of Matthew. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that the book of Matthew portrays Jesus Christ as king, and at the same time is the only book which says, kingdom of heaven each gospel shows you a different look at the lord jesus christ matthew shows you jesus christ as king coming from a kingly line mark shows you jesus christ as a servant luke shows you jesus christ as the son of man and john shows you jesus christ as the son of god the kingdom of heaven is mentioned in one book it is mentioned in matthew and matthew portrays jesus christ as king this is because he is going to be king over a physical kingdom of heaven. Matthew eleven twelve says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So if you look at the kingdom of God, you will see that it cannot be taken by violence. It does not have anything to do with physical weapons. The ones we are fighting are spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians six twelve says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning they aren't of the flesh. You can't take over the kingdom of God by violence but you can take over the kingdom of heaven by violence. As it says in Matthew 13, 24 through 30, the kingdom of heaven can have both saved and lost people. And you'll see that with the parable of the wheat and the tares there in Matthew 24 through 30. And people are fighting over the kingdom of heaven. It can be taken by violence. It can have lost people in it. It can have flesh and blood in it. The kingdom of God is only safe people because you enter in by the new birth. And not everyone in the millennial kingdom will be saved. So you will have lost people in the kingdom of heaven. You can clearly see this because Satan forms an army, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea in Revelation 20 and verse 8. And this is after they have lived in the millennial kingdom. They still Go against the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are 13 places where the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably. And this leads many to believe that they are the same, same kingdom. For example, in places where Matthew's gospel said kingdom of heaven, Mark and Luke will sometimes say kingdom of God. And this is because Jesus Christ is present and he is king, the true king of both kingdoms who is offering both kingdoms to the Jews. In the millennial kingdom, both kingdoms are present because the king of both kingdoms is present. Jesus Christ will be ruling a physical, earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. At the same time, during the millennial kingdom, there will be glorified saints, the born-again believers and glorified bodies walking around on the earth at the same time, and that is your kingdom of God. The two kingdoms merge in the millennium. But let's take a quick overview of the kingdoms throughout the Bible. In Genesis 1 through 3, you see God setting up his kingdom. Adam is king over both kingdoms under the Lord himself. He is king over the kingdom of God because he was made in the image of God. He is king over the kingdom of heaven because God gave him dominion over the physical earth. Hebrews 2 7 says, Adam was crowned with glory and honor. He was crowned like a king. He was king of the hill. He has a crown and he has dominion. He's so 
so much king he names the animals in Genesis 2.19. He can freely eat off any tree in the garden except the one. So the world is his. In Genesis 3-6 through you have the devil trying to ruin the kingdom. He sees that crown of glory on the head of Adam. And he gets Adam and Eve to sin by eating off the tree. So Adam loses the kingdom of God because he lost the image of God when he sinned. Satan gets the power of death. Adam and Eve die spiritually that day. You see, the former king, devil, the devil, which is Lucifer, he got jealous when he saw that crown of glory. And he knocked it right off, Adam said. In God's game of thrones, men have free will. The spirits have free will. He will let them move around as they please to a certain extent. However, if Satan the devil, which is Lucifer, the former king gets his way, then he would just kill everybody. So the kingdom falls into the hands of Lucifer again. So the Lord raises up Noah, a just man, perfect in his generations. And Satan tried to form a counterfeit kingdom around the time Noah lived in Genesis chapter 6. But you see the Lord come with Noah's flood to wipe out Satan's counterfeit race. In Genesis chapter 9 after the flood, the Lord gives the kingdom into the hands of Noah. He is told to be fruitful and multiply just like Adam and Eve. And Noah and his family are the only people on the earth. He has dominion. But you'll see the former king of both kingdoms tries to come and destroy Noah. But at this point, Noah kicks the devil out of the way and says, King me. He's king at this time, under the Lord, of course. And it doesn't take long for the devil to attack for the throne again. He gets Noah drunk. And things just go down from here. It goes so far down that in chapter 10 and 11, you see man become extremely wicked again, even after the flood. You see the Tower of Babel. You see Nimrod's kingdom. He was a mighty hunter, but also a wicked man. And man tried to reach new heights without God and build a tower to reach the second heaven. They were trying to make contact with those sons of God again, like they did in Genesis 6. They tried to make themselves a name instead of giving glory to the name of God, the name above every name. After Noah, you get into the story of Abraham. Abraham is the one God wants to use to make his earthly kingdom. And in Genesis 12, Abraham has promised a seed. This seed would get the kingdom of heaven, a literal, visible, physical kingdom on earth. From Abraham would come Isaac, Jacob, and the nation of Israel. You are also introduced to a very mysterious character around this time named Melchizedek. He is king of three thrones. He has a throne in the city of Salem. He was also king of righteousness and king of peace. And since the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace, Melchizedek is the first man since Adam to be a crown holder of the kingdom of God. And when Abraham dies, the kingdom passes to Abraham's seed, which went to Isaac, then to Jacob, which is Israel. And the rest of the book of Genesis from Abraham and onward deals with the formulation of of the nation of Israel. And with Jacob came the twelve tribes. God narrowed it down to one tribe that would be promised the kingdom, and that is Judah. As it says in Genesis 49.10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. David the king comes from the tribe of Judah. Judah is one of Jacob's twelve sons, and he is promised the kingdom. At the end of Genesis, you will find Israel is in Egypt. And when you get to the book of Exodus, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is threatened by them because there are so many of them running around. And at this time, God has already been preparing a man named Moses to take over. You will read in Exodus where Moses and Pharaoh go back and forth with each other. Moses and the magicians go back and forth. The Lord plagues Pharaoh and Egypt through Moses and Aaron. But Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy show you the Lord setting up the kingdom of heaven. He wanted them to go and possess the promised land of Canaan. Through their unbelief, they wouldn't take the land and ended up wandering 40 years. 
But you see in these books how signs and wonders are associated with the Lord trying to get Israel to believe his words. The signs and wonders are associated with the kingdom of heaven, not with the kingdom of God. Then you get to Joshua. This is where Israel finally gets into the land. They receive the promises given to Abraham about the land. In the book of Judges, you see where Israel begins to rebel against the Lord. Every man was doing what was right in his own eyes, and the Lord would allow them to be taken by their enemies. Israel would then call on the Lord. Out of compassion on his people, the Lord would send them deliverers or judges. The book of Ruth also takes place during this time period. And then you get into the books of the kings. First and second Samuel, first second Kings, first and second Chronicles. These books deal with the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. Israel wanted a king. God wanted to be king of their heart. However, God gives them what they want. He gives them King Saul. So now King Saul has the kingdom, but he's a wicked king. After Saul, you have King David. And then David's son Solomon. This was Israel's greatest time was under David and Solomon. The beginning of Solomon's reign is a picture of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ because he had complete peace at the time. During the time of these books of the kings, the wisdom books are written. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These were primarily written by the two kings, David and Solomon. The book of Job is also a wisdom book that was most likely written during the time of Genesis. But after King Solomon, you read about king after king after king. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're evil. The nation falls apart because of wicked rulers. Even though during this time you have great prophets preaching against the sins of the people, prophets like Obadiah, Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, I Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk. You see, Jeconiah, a very wicked king. After him, the Lord takes away the kingdom from Israel. As it says in Jeremiah 22, 28 through 30. Is this man Coniah, a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore they cast out he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David, and ruling any more in Judah. So at that time, the kingdom of heaven disappears from the earth. In the sense of a true kingdom of heaven, that God's trying to establish, it disappears. And then you have King Zedekiah, who wasn't a real king, because the kingdom had been taken. He gets into it with Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he ends up with his eyes gouged out and his sons murdered. The time was 606 BC. The nation of Israel was over, and the times of the Gentiles began. And during the captivity, you have prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel preaching the word of the Lord. When you get to the end of Second Chronicles, the power is in the hand of Cyrus, king of Persia. And it says in Second Chronicles 36, 22 through 23, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all this, his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. So the kingdom went to the devil after Jeconiah. Now everyone gets world domination, who gets world domination, gets power from the devil. But here, this Cyrus, not even a, a godly king, he's going to allow them to go back to Jerusalem. It says, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? 
The Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. So Cyrus is going to allow some of God's people to go back in and build. But the kingdom went to the devil after Jeconiah. And that is why the devil says what he says to Jesus Christ in Luke 4, 6. He says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will, I will give it. So the power is in Satan's hand to give out the kingdoms, as allowed by the Lord God. The kingdoms have been delivered to the devil, so the devil is called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ himself calls him the prince of this world in John 14.30. Jesus even says Satan has a kingdom in Luke 11.18. And Ephesians 6.12 shows us that the devil and his minions are rulers of the darkness of this world. And Job 41.34 calls him king over all the children of pride. For, so from 606 B.C., and to the time of Jesus Christ, there was no kingdom of heaven on this earth. And there was no kingdom of God available since Adam fell. No true kingdom of heaven. The kingdoms were in the hands of the devil, these Gentile kingdoms. At 606 BC, the kingdoms of this world are turned over to the devil and the Gentiles run the earth. And you will see the Jews return to the land in the book of Ezra to rebuild the city. And in Nehemiah, you see them rebuilding the wall and the temple because, you know, they got permission from Cyrus. However, this doesn't mean they got the kingdom back. During this time, you have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi as the prophets preaching, and the Jews were still under Gentile power. But then you get to the Gospels. You see John the Baptist step on the scene. He jumps up on the back of his pickup truck or, or his stump or his soapbox or on top of a Pharisee's back and says the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 3, 2. Another time he said the kingdom of God is at hand in Mark 1, 15. This is because the king of both kingdoms was present. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the true king. There may be kings under him, but he's king of kings and lord of lords. There may have been other kings over the kingdom of heaven, but he's king of that king. At the first coming, he came to offer both kingdoms to the Jews. It is consistent with the Bible. When the first Adam first showed up back in Genesis, both kingdoms were present. Now when the second Adam shows up, Jesus Christ, both kingdoms are present. So John and Jesus Christ preached the kingdom of heaven as a coming political institution. They also preached the kingdom of God to individuals to get their heart ready to receive the kingdom of heaven. But you know the story. The Jews reject Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven is gone. And the Gentiles still control the kingdom through the devil. The kingdom of God remains on earth through the body of Christ. That is the church, the bride of Christ. The church is made up of every born again believer. And if you're saved then you're in that kingdom of God. So at first, at the first coming of Christ, he offers both kingdoms to Israel. They reject Jesus Christ and you have the postponement of the kingdom called the church age. That's what you're in now. One day the church is going to be raptured out. And you can read about this event in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. And when we are raptured out, the kingdom of God leaves the earth. Then at this time you will have a false kingdom of heaven established by the Antichrist during what is commonly referred to as the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, the king of kings and lord of lords comes back and brings in both kingdoms. He brings in the kingdom of God because the church, the glorified believers come back with him and he brings in the kingdom of heaven and rules on a physical, visible, literal throne. This is the millennial reign. And during the millennial reign, the kingdom of God is in full manifestation because the glorified saints are present. And the kingdom of heaven is in full manifestation because Jesus Christ is on the throne in Jerusalem. So in Matthew 6:10, Jesus tells the disciples to pray. And he says in Matthew 6, 9 and 10, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 
that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus Christ brings in the millennial kingdom, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not happening yet. It won't happen till then. But when you get out into eternity, you have the kingdom of heaven through the body of Christ reigning in glorified bodies. You also have the kingdom of heaven because the nation of Israel, or excuse me, you have the kingdom of God because through the body of Christ reigning in glorified bodies. And then you have the kingdom of heaven because the nation of Israel is populating the kingdom of heaven. So you have both kingdoms throughout eternity. So the Bible starts with someone fighting over a throne and ends with people on thrones. A kingdom and kings is the main subject of the Bible. Revelation twenty two fifteen says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You're going to have kings reigning throughout eternity. But with this overview of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, let's go through the Bible and look at these kingdoms and kings. And while we're doing that, let's also look at the things like the covenants and the dispensations and just many other things that the Bible talks about. But this has been episode one of God's Game of Thrones.